Thank you for that great introduction. Um, my name is Stephanie White, and I'm an attorney at Lozano Smith. And today I'm going to be talking to you about Title IX and the important role that you all have as employees of this district. So within the next 30 minutes, it's my hope that you will all have a basic understanding of what Title IX is as it applies to sexual harassment and sexual assault. We're also going to go over the duties of the responsible employee. And you can see up there, I have responsible employee in quotations. This is a term that was coined by the Office for Civil Rights, and you'll sometimes hear me call them OCR, for those employees that they say have a specific obligation under Title IX. And as a big spoiler, if you're here today, you are a responsible employee, and what OCR tells us is that you have a duty to identify potential Title IX violations and to report those violations. So the goal of today is going to be to tell you how to do those two things. And by the end of my time up here, um, it's my hope that you'll understand why this is so important. I'm going to kick things off showing you a video. Um, and just, just as a forewarning, some people might find the content a little disturbing and upsetting. And I, I realize that, but the truth of the matter is, is that when we're talking about Title IX and sexual harassment and sexual assault, these are really hard um, subject matters, and they can cause a lot of people like to be to become upset and frustrated, especially when it's your students that we're talking about. Um, but I think this goes to show just why these types of trainings are so important, so that we can all serve our community and the students. So, go ahead. High school board is being targeted in a federal lawsuit. A mother accuses a student of sexually abusing her daughter. Aaron Guy explains. Aaron. Well, this lawsuit goes into detail. The abuse, a 16-year-old disabled student told her mother she went through while at school. And while that student and her alleged abuser are not named in this case, school leaders are. The fact of the matter is that the school failed in the responsibility to the child to protect her from this situation. They failed to supervise properly. The Lubovic Law Group is representing the family who say their 16-year-old, who has the mental capacity of a 7-year-old, was raped and sexually abused on at least two occasions here at Westwood High School. The accused abuser, another student, also with a mental disability. The mother of the boy alerted the school system to the fact that this child, the boy, had these problems when he was brought into the school system and admitted. Then we know that there was a period of weeks in which the teachers encouraged a, a love relationship between the kids for the purposes of controlling them, we believe. Attorneys say it was during that relationship that there were sexual encounters, one of which may have been covered up by a teacher. In the lawsuit, attorneys claim the classroom teacher realized what had been happening and in an attempt to cover up the sexual abuse that had just occurred on his watch, gave the alleged victim a clean shirt and told her to put it on and throw the old one away. They were left alone and or not attended to correctly under the different rules and regulations that the school has to abide by when dealing with children with these types of needs. Thank you for playing that for us. Um, so we'll revisit this this video at the end of my 30 minute um, segment, segment here. <laughs> um, my goal and hope is that you'll be able, after we get into the meat and potatoes of all of this, to understand how and why this is a Title IX um, issue, what the teacher should have done, what the district should have done, who's liable here, and what the overall impact is when things like this happen for the community and for the district and for the individuals in the district. Before we start getting into the law and identifying these potential Title IX issues, um, I just want you to all keep in mind your role as role models um, for the children, for our students in, in the community. Um, it's you guys who they watch every day. They look to you for how you're speaking with one another, how you're speaking to them, how you're interacting with one another. And I think that really sets the tone um, for our community and what behaviors are appropriate and inappropriate. So that's always just a good thing to keep in mind as we're going through this content. So what the heck is Title IX? So really brief background. Um, Title IX's been around since 1972. 
It was signed into law by President Nixon, and the statute is really short, really succinct. I put the whole thing on one slide, and it presents an overall intent and goal, which is to remove any sexual barriers that are going to prevent people um, from gaining all that your educational institution or your schools have to offer. It's best known for, does anyone want to shout it out? Sports. Sports, Sports right. That's how most people think about Title IX. But we know from OCR that this also applies to sexual harassment and sexual assault. So I'll just quickly read the statute since it's so short. Um, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subjected to discrimination under any education program or activity receiving federal financial, financial assistance. Um, so I can appreciate that it's not intuitive that something like this would apply to sexual harassment and sexual assault. But the way I like to explain it is, if you have a student who has been or is, or is being subjected to ongoing harassment or was sexually assaulted, when they come into your classroom and they sit there to learn and they're not able to absorb the information because of what experiences they've had, they're not, they're not receiving the same benefits of the learning environment that the same other kids are who are sitting next to them. And for this reason, the Office for Civil Rights says that it's the district's responsibility to do what it can to get that student to a place where she can continue to learn, um, which we'll talk about interim measures, things that schools can do to, to help them be, be in a place where they can equally benefit from all that the schools have to offer. So sexual harassment is defined as an unwelcome sexual act that's either severe, persistent, or pervasive so much that it limits a student's ability to learn or it creates a hostile environment. So to break this down a little more, an unwelcome conduct can mean many things. Um, it can be um, lewd acts, lewd gestures, unwelcome touching, grabbing someone's body parts when they do not want to be grabbed. It can be um, if you send me nude pictures, I will not mark you absent today. Or if you don't continue to send me nude pictures, I will release those that, um, that I already have of you. Sufficiently severe or pervasive. Severe is going to be something that like really shocks your conscience. So one rape could be severe enough to create a hostile environment for that student. Um, persistent or pervasive sent, tends to be, need a little more analysis. But it's one act that, just that act alone, probably isn't going to cause a hostile environment. But if that act is happening every day on an ongoing basis, that cumulative effect is enough to impact that student's learning environment. Okay, I gave you some examples. Um, some others are um, unwanted flirtations or propositions, derogatory comments or sexual jokes, spreading sexual rumors, massages or unwanted touching, um, comments about a student's body, or um, acts of sex without consent. <coughs> okay, so where can these Title IX violations happen? Um, the most obvious one is at school or at a school-related activity. So anytime you're on campus or you're at a football game, a homecoming dance, Title IX of violations can happen at all of these places. The second is at non-school-sponsored events. Um, I like to break this up into two categories. So A is usually the most easy to understand because it's what we look for when we're trying to figure out if we can discipline students. So it's if there's a nexus to school. Was the student going to or coming home from school? Um, is there a way we can link it to a football party or an athletic event? The second part is when I get the most um, surprised looks on people's faces. Title IX violations can occur 
even if they happen off campus and are in no way connected to your school. The only connection might be that the student is one of your students, and that's it. So that means you can have a Title IX violation during summer break at a random house party that the school didn't even know was going to happen, know nothing about, but it involves one or more of your students. Violations can occur, th occur there, and if you learn about them, there's an obligation to report them. And we'll talk a little more about what I mean when I say reporting. Parties can include student-on-student -student, um, sexual harassment, sexual assault. They can involve one student and one employee. It's not up here. It can also involve employee on employee. Um, we usually don't talk about that as much because Title VII makes more sense than Title IX for employee on employee violations, but employees are also protected under Title IX. It can include an outsider and a student. It can include a volunteer and a student. It can include the mailman or UPS person who comes on to campus to deliver something and interferes with a student. A lot of the times in the samples I give for Title IX, I'll refer to um, a female student as being a victim or the complainant and a male student as being the perpetrator or respondent. To be clear, it goes both ways. It can be same-sex parties, and it can be opposite-sex parties. So who's responsible for addressing these Title IX complaints? The first person is the Title IX coordinator, and that is Margarita for your district. Every district has to have a Title IX coordinator. They should be clearly identified, and their duty is to coordinate um, trainings like this. They make sure that your policies are all up to snuff and in compliance um, with Title IX and OCR's guidelines. And they're in charge of overseeing the overall process of investigating Title IX complaints and identifying if there's any systemic issues district-wide that require specialized trainings. And there is Ms. Navarro's contact information. It's also on the sheets that you um, received earlier. The next person is the responsible employee. And as I told you, this is all of you guys. And your key duties are twofold. First, to identify potential Title IX investigations. And once you've identified a potential violation, to report those. And here, we're going to report them either to your Title IX coordinator or your principal or AP. Okay, you might learn of Title IX violations in a couple different ways. So the first is what we probably most often think of. A student comes up to you and discloses information that they may have been subjected to a sexual assault or sexual harassment. You might also learn about these um, by things that you observe, if you observe the unwelcome conduct, or through an anonymous tip, an email, someone brings you this information in another way. Maybe you're reading through a student's journal at night and you see that they've disclosed something in there. Once you have information that could potentially be a Title IX violation, if that information came to you verbally only, you have a duty to tell that complainant or that reporting student that one, you have to report what they've told you to the principal, AP, or Title IX coordinator. This slide only applies for verbal complaints. If you see something written in a journal, you observe a conduct, or someone anonymously tells you about it, your only duty is gonna be to tell the Title IX coordinator, your principal, or an AP. But if a student comes to you you need to tell them about your obligation to disclose what they've told you to the principal, AP, or Title IX coordinator, even if they ask you not to. You can tell them that if they have concerns of confidentiality, you can report that um, to the administrator who you're going to report to, but you can't promise the student confidentiality. 
The district will take that into consideration and it respects and understands a student's desire to be confidential. Um, but because of the district's other duties and because of some laws that may um, require disclosure, we cannot promise this to students. You can also tell the students about their right to seek, to seek um, confidential counseling and to seek local and law enforcement if they're the ones who approach you. Typically, this third prong is going to be handled by your administrators just because they'll have more information and resources, um, but you can disclose that to them as well. And again, this is only for verbal complaints that are brought to your attention. And just as a reminder, at this stage, if a student approaches you, as I'm sure you're all already aware, your demeanor and tone are going to be key because you want to make sure um, not, to, not to further upset a student who's potentially been through a lot already. Um, so be sensitive, be kind, um, and understanding. Okay, do I have a volunteer for confidentiality concerns? Please don't tell anyone. I'm a socialist. I'm an English teacher at Mountain View. A female 10th grade student approached me during lunch and told me that a male classmate began passing her sexually explicit photographs during class. She told me that he won't stop, even though she has repeatedly asked him to. The student explained to me that she has been cutting class to avoid this male student. I've known this student for a long time, and she asked me for advice on what she should do. I know she came to me because she trusts me. The student asked me to promise her that I wouldn't tell anyone else what she told me. She thinks that if the principal finds out, it will only make things worse. Is it okay for me to keep this secret? If not, can I just report the issue to the school without disclosing the names of the students? Okay, is it okay for our English teacher to keep this a secret? Because the student did ask her. No, you guys are right. We just learned that the English teacher is a responsible employee and has a duty to report any potential Title IX violations. We also know that this student is receiving um, explicit photographs, though we don't really know what that photo is. We don't really know how bad it is. Um, so we don't know if it's severe, but we do know that it's persistent, right? Every day. Um, during an investigation, that would be important for someone to find out. Like, what is this photograph of? If it's of her, it's going to be a lot more serious. If it's of another student, it's going to be a lot more serious. If it's a cartoon that just happens to upset this student that most people um, wouldn't be offended by, who knows? But that's not your job to investigate. All you, you have to go with the facts that you know. So you know a photo is being passed to her, Every day, it's persistent, pervasive, and you know that because of it, she's either not coming to class, or when she's there, she's not really able to focus. So all of these things lead us to believe, hey, potential Title IX violation. So you do have a duty to report. One way we could change the facts in this situation a little bit would be if the student came up to the teacher and said, teacher, I'm going to tell you something, it's serious, and I don't want you to tell anyone what I'm about to tell you. In that case, the teacher could tell the student, um, listen, I'm here for you, but I want you to know before you tell me this, that I'm going to have an obligation to possibly report what you're telling me um, to my principal or AP. And of course, that way the student could decide if they want to disclose it and, this, and the teacher could guide them to um, someone confidential who they could freely talk to. Now how about, um, can the teacher disclose this information to the AP or principal without actually giving the student's name? What if the teacher just reports what happens and tells the principal this is the kid who's doing it. I don't want to tell you who they're doing it to because she asked for her confidentiality and it'll only make things worse. What do you guys think? No. 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 Okay. Um, districts will maintain confidentiality to the extent possible, but for the purposes of you reporting up to the AP or principal, 
you're required to report pretty much everything you know. And do not investigate on your own. Um, this is going to be key. As I said, do not look into those pictures. T OCR, the Office for Civil Rights, requires very specific trainings for people who are going to investigate. This is not that training. So in order for people to be qualified in doing their investigations, they have to go through that training. So it is important that you limit your involvement um, to listening, accepting the information, and reporting it up. And what you're supposed to report is the identity of all parties that you're aware of. So the complainant, the victim, if those people are the same, they could be two different people. You can have a friend say, my other friend was subjected to sexual assault. In that case, you'd have a complainant, a reporter, and a victim. Um, you're also required to report who the respondent is or the accused person and any witnesses that you might be aware of. You're also required to tell your principal or AP the date, the time, the location, and any information that you know about those incidences to the extent um, that you're aware of it. If you don't have all this information when the complainant verbally reports it to you, just go with what you have. Don't look into it further. If you see in a journal entry that a student um, discloses they were subjected to sexual assault or sexual harassment, don't find that student to get this information. Just take that journal entry to your principal or your AP and let them initiate the investigation. Okay, it's really important that we keep in mind timelines for all of this. Um, all of your Title IX investigation procedures are under the Uniform Complaint Procedures, which is EP and AR 1312.3. Um, um, if you're interested in how it all works in detail, feel free to check that out. The timeline that's going to apply to you all as responsible employees is the one-day timeline when you learn of a potential violation to report it. Um, what makes sense or best practice is as soon as possible, but your policies require one day. And the reason for this is because the district has an overall obligation to get things going immediately. They're going to have to put into place what we're going to define a little bit later as interim measures. Um, and those, go, those happen immediately before anyone has done anything to investigate to protect the students. And the district's going to be required to investigate within 60 days. It sounds like a lot of time, but all the little steps in between during the investigation process take up a lot of time. So this is actually a pretty quick turnaround. So for you all, one day to report what you've learned as a potential violation. Okay, don't forget your mandated reporter duties. These are two separate things that often overlap. So under California, under the penal code, you all know that you have a duty to report potential child abuse or neglect. There's often a lot of overlap with Title IX. Um, it's not one or the other, it's both. So I just wanted to point that out so you, you can all keep that in mind. When, you're, when you might see a potential Title IX violation, also think, is, is my obligation to report Triggered. Okay, requests for interim measures. So that if it's both, then you have to do both channels, both the yeah, you have to district Title Nine and the and the mandated reporting. And if you just do one, then you violated the law. So her question is, do you do you have to do both? And if you don't, did you do you violate the law? So the answer is um, yes. You have to do both. So you need to report up to your principal or AP for Title IX. You also have to file a CPS report under California law. Um, they're, two, yeah, they're two separate things. It is important to, um, to do, address both. Okay, and my second volunteer. Okay. I am a social studies teacher at MDLA. In the middle of the school year, I was told by my AP that I must allow one of my students to leave class whenever she wants, and that I have to allow her to take, retake an exam from last month. The AP explained that the requests were interim measures that were the result of a Title IX investigation. The AP also told me that the student's family requested that the details of the Title IX investigation not be shared. 
Typically, I do not allow any students to leave my class without my permission or to retake tests. <laughs> Must I allow it in this situation, even though I don't have all the details as to what's going on? So this slide goes to what we call intro measures. Um, intro measures are really important, and these, th this is what um, OCR refers to as intro measures, as the things that you're going to put in place so that the student can be restored to a position where they can immediately start to benefit from the educational environment. This happens even before you've investigated. So you're basically taking the complainant's word um, for what they have. Interim measures are going to be different in every situation, and your district administrator or the person who is put in charge of investigating the complaints is going to, under, is going to evaluate and determine what's appropriate for that specific situation. So it might be in certain situations that you're asked, please let this child leave class, um, and, and please let this child retake a test. Other interim measures can include offering them counseling services, medical services, other forms of academic support. Um, no contact orders given to the respondent. That means just please stay away from the complainant. The student's lockers may be moved to different sides of campus. Their schedules might be changed. Um, all of these things would, could be an appropriate interim measure depending on the situation. In most cases, you will probably understand why you're being asked to do what you are, um, what you are being asked to do, but it's going to be on a case-by-case -case basis that the district evaluates what's appropriate and speaks to the family about their concerns for confidentiality. So some of these might need to be on a need-to-know basis. So I'm about to wrap it up. So these are just the couple of takeaways from today. So first is that Title IX prohibits all discrimination based on sex, and that includes sexual harassment and sexual assault. You are all responsible employees, and you have an, a duty to identify potential Title IX violations and to report those violations. And your report should include all the information you know without investigating names, um, location, time, place, and what happened. You have to do that report in a timely manner. One day, but as soon as possible, is best practice. You cannot promise confidentiality to students who verbally report to you. You're expected to implement interim measures that are requested to, of you by um, administrators, and it's really important to remember that those interim measures are being put into place um, to protect the students and to help them achieve all that they can. Lastly, this is just a slide of some resources. Um, so earlier I mentioned your board policies and administrative regulations that go through your uniform complaint procedures in great detail. These are also the slides for um, the EEOC, the, the U.S. Equal, Equal Employment Opportunities Commission, OCR, and the, um, oops, what's our last one there? And the OCR complaint form. Um, you can visit all these if you have questions or looking for more information. Do we have time for questions? Two minutes for questions. Yes. Does don't investigate mean don't ask any questions? Like if they say someone did something, say who or... Just yeah, minimal, minimal questions are, are fine. Um, when I say don't investigate, I mean um, don't seek out complainants. If they tell you who, who, like, who did this to you, um, don't go and follow up with that respondent. Don't go above and beyond to look for additional information. Um, but as far as consoling the person and being compassionate and finding out those baseline things, especially if you might be the only person that they're willing to speak to, is okay. Yes? What if they don't want to tell you who's harassing them? That happened. Her question is, what if they don't want to tell you who's harassing them? Um, and this, this happens sometimes. And it's important to remember you can encourage disclosure, 
but you don't want to subject the student to more trauma or harm than they've already undergone. So in no case would it be appropriate to force them to tell you. You can encourage it, say, um, you know, the district only wants to help. The district prohibits retaliation. We want to make sure that we can protect you and other students in the community. But bottom line is, do not force disclosure and just report to um, your AP or principal the, the information that you have. That was a really good question. Thank you. Yeah, so um, her question was, if you find out there's a, a picture one time, based on what you know, it doesn't sound like it's that bad. Um, it's definitely not severe. It's not of the student or of another student. Do you report that if it's something minor and you're not sure if you can establish persistent or pervasive? And the answer is yes. That would be important to report and let the administrators determine or whoever's designated to investigate whether it's enough to meet those thresholds to cause a hostile environment. So yeah, take the liability off yourselves and just, just report up. So who can you refer students to when asked, um, when they want to talk to someone confidenti confidentially? Um, OCR lists um, certain counselors, clergy members, um, the, the police would not necessarily be confidential, but you could refer them to the police. Um, but we're going to want to be very clear on who the confidential people are in your, in your community and at your schools. And Margarita, I'm wondering if we could like um, talk about that and then put together a clear list for, for everyone to re refer to. So, because um, it is important that the student knows if what they're disclosing is confidential or not. Any more questions? Uh, yes. Talk about sex. Does this also extend to like, issues of gender and gender identity and gender expression? Um, so that's a great question, and it's a, it's kind of a tricky question. So Title IX is a federal law, and we rely a lot, very heavily, on OCR's guidance on what the heck this statute means and who it pertains to. And as we all know, things are changing right now. And recently, there had been some transgender guidance that had been put out by the Obama administration that was rescinded. Um, so the question is, for federal, it depends. But the bottom line is, is that we're in California, and under your policies, it doesn't matter if it's California law or Title IX that we're relying on. Um, all of these are going to be processed through your uniform complaint procedures. Yes. Oh, that's a good question, and I'm not exactly sure. <laughs> um, the district's obligation to communicate with families is not part of Title IX or OCR's guidelines. Um, so it's probably, feel free to jump in if I'm wrong, it's probably going to be a case-by-case -case basis, um, depending on the student's age, subject matter, if the police are involved, um, I'm assuming that your administrators will weigh all these things into consideration. That's correct. Case Is that good? Case by case. Case by case. We have time for some more? Okay, one more. Um, so earlier you stated that if we read in a journal or something, we didn't need to tell the student that we're going to report. But they came to us and told us verbally we would. What if we overhear two students talking? Do we need to inform that student that we're going to admin, or do we treat that as if we read in a journal? I would treat that as re reading it in a journal um, and just re report up because you don't want to be put in the position where you're starting an investigation when you haven't been trained on like demeanor and tone and you know being sensitive to the, to the issues or what to ask. Thank you for that question. Okay, and I think we're all out of time. Thanks for being a great audience. <laughs>